Well, hi to everybody and hi to the faculty audience and I appreciate uh, being uh, interviewed today. Um, so uh, I've been asked to talk about netnography and uh, netnography uh, in short is a form of qualitative research that focuses on social media. So it uses social media data and it also focuses on people's experiences of social media. So social media is a, a very big topic. It's something that uh, has a long history. Um, I believe that social media has been around almost 50 years since electronic communications began uh, in the uh, late 1960s and early 1970s. And if we look at social media as a cultural phenomenon, rather than as simply a dump of content or a mix of files, uh, we find out that uh, we may need cultural sorts of methods to use in order to understand what's going on there uh, from a human perspective, from a social perspective. And so I developed netnography uh, starting around the mid 1990s when the internet was still a fairly new thing uh, in order to take advantage of the fact that we had techniques like ethnography, which helped us to understand the world and other cultures in a way that was sensitive to the fact that these were living beings going through experiences just as we all do as, as living human beings. Uh, and so netnography is um, a method that has uh, four main things, four main characteristics when I explain it to people. Uh, the first one is that it has this lineage that traces back to ethnography. So it's a cultural method. What that means is that we pay attention to the context of human experiences. We look at things like identities and roles and language and meanings, things that are very difficult to pick up in other ways. There are numerous ways to study social media data. Uh, all of them valid and useful for certain kinds of research questions. Netnography is one way to ask and answer some of the kinds of questions that ethnographers ask about the human experience. What, is, what are the meanings here? Uh, what are the languages? What are the implications of the symbol systems? And so on. And so this cultural and contextual focus of netnography that links back to ethnography is the first characteristic. The second characteristic, as I said, is that it really focuses on social media. And most of the time it uses data that's generated from social media. Sometimes it's a reflection of social media data uh, that we get from an interview or from the researcher's own reflections. But a lot of the time it is uh, saving, screen grabbing, sharing, downloading, even having mined uh, different uh, data that is on social media. The third thing, and I've already sort of alluded to this, is that it requires the researcher's own immersion in the experience. So there's a researcher uh, involvement. Uh, ethnographers talk about the uh, researcher as the instrument of doing the research. And so in ethnography, we follow this and have this immersive sense that the researcher or research team is engaging in the naturalistic setting in which the, the cultural phenomena, in this case, something relating to or around or using social media and, and social media uh, platforms and communications, uh, that that's going on. And the last one, and probably the most important one, uh, when you're trying to understand what is netnography, and the one that's the most confusion, is that there's a general um, category of ethnographies being adapted to uh, using online data and uh, addressing the fact that people use electronic communications. And this has been going on since before I came on the scene. In, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, people were starting to already uh, adapt ethnographic techniques and they would moderate uh, ethnography with a word like online or web or virtual. Uh, so they would talk about this general, so the general category I like to think of is online ethnography, taking or social media ethnography also works, taking ethnography and adapting it to social media. 
Netnography is one of these techniques like virtual ethnography or digital ethnography and so on that does this, but does it in a particular way. So before netnography came along, a lot of people said they were doing online ethnography and then they just did what they thought was a reasonable uh, adaptation of ethnography to the online environment. And that worked for them and uh, you know that was great, but it made it hard to replicate what they were doing. And so as a PhD student, when I started using these methods, I'm in a field marketing where we have a lot, it's kind of a tower of Babel uh, where we have a lot of different methods. And because of that, people asked, you know, how are you doing that exactly? What does that mean that you're adapting uh, ethnography to this online environment? Can you do that? Well, what happens uh, because people don't really know that you're there? Can you really can you can you do that? Uh, does it uh, follow good research ethics guidelines, for example? And so I had to figure out what good research practice was uh, for doing this, not only uh, for ethical reasons, but also handling these this amount of data, um, doing something that wasn't necessarily content analysis, uh, but uh, but leveraged some of the strengths of content analysis in a way that was true to to uh, qualitative inquiry and and the uh, the practices of of uh, ethnographers across multiple social science fields. And so I like to say that ethnography is a procedural approach to performing qualitative social media research. So by that, I mean that ethnography encompasses this set of general instructions and steps that allow someone who is uh, starting out in this or someone who's been doing it a little while too, to move through from a research question to collecting data to analyzing that data to presenting their research uh, in a way that is consistent uh, and rigorous and so that uh, if you say that you are doing a netnography we know what that means we know how you for example address data collection issues there are terminologies there are sub procedures there that you just have to mention in your method uh, section or in your uh, IRB or human subjects research application that when you say that there's a certain consistency and, and we know what what that is. So, you know, it, in summary, when someone asks me, what is an ethnography? I say it's a certain way of doing an online ethnography that in itself uh, is consistently updated and is is somewhat dynamic. So again, it's true to the traditions of ethnography in that it's contextual and cultural, it uses social media data, it requires an immersive engagement, and all of these things are in common with online ethnography. But what makes it a netnography is that it has these affiliations with other people who are doing netnography and with a set of specific operational procedures that provide a foundation. That foundation can be changed, it can be altered, and it often is. No two netnographies are the same. But those foundations link you to a body of work and to a research tradition within eth within netnography as well as within ethnography. There's obviously a theoretical and methodological link to ethnography, which came from uh, anthropology, in particular to Bronislaw Malinowski's uh, work um, among the uh, Trobriand Islanders and many others, which really formed the methodological foundation for anthropology, cultural anthropology as we know it today, and really grounded a lot of the work on uh, ethnography as a form of participant observation that we're uh, familiar with in the social sciences. So one of the obvious methodological and theoretical groundings of um, netnography, particularly the early years, if I can call it that, the early years of netnography when I first started out was, was this thought that we could apply uh, these methods of studying cultures and communities uh, to the cultures and communities uh, that existed online. What became um, apparent after 10 or 15 uh, or more years of doing this was that it was really hard to think about cultures and communities in the same way in social media as we do when, for example, someone gets into a boat and sails to Bora Bora 
and lives with the Bora Borans for an ethnographic year or more, uh, learns their language, goes to funerals, uh, oftentimes uh, gets to know the elders and the young ones in the community. This is a little different from studying a topic like, um, uh, uh, let's say, white supremacy online uh, and understanding the various manifestations of white supremacy. Because there is no island of white supremacists that one goes to and lives with for a while, even though if you're doing an ethnography on that topic, it might feel like it because you're getting to know characters and you're listening to the voices, but you might spend a lot of time on, let's say, Reddit or 4chan, or you might spend a lot of time on uh, Twitter, uh, or you might spend a lot of time in the dark web or on blogs uh, or watching YouTube videos that have a uh, subtle innuendo. Uh, and so um, you go across platforms. It's hard to say that there's a community or a uh, 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 even a, a discrete culture in the same way. And so this notion of what a community is, what a culture is, starts to break down and the whole notion of what a field is or a field site uh, starts to break down. Um, so, um, you know, the, the methodological groundwork of netnography really um, transpired in trying to adapt to the fact that these were very dispersed uh, very disparate uh, 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 cultures, if we can call them that. And so, you know, I think researchers are still playing with um, the notion of how close netnography is to traditional ethnography and how much it has affiliations with something like computer science instead, uh, where we are uh, working with data, how close uh, the analytic frame is to things like narrative and thematic analysis. Mm -hmm. And so netnography is, I, say, I like to say, it's, it's a promiscuous sort of field. It, it absorbs and takes things. It's sort of, you know, in some ways, it's like uh, new ages to religion. Uh, it picks and chooses uh, affiliations between fields. And every netnography is different. There are no two netnographies that have been conducted, not that I've conducted and not that anyone's conducted, that go exactly the same way. The theoretical affiliations are different. The methodological adaptations are different. But some of the core elements of how you treat data, how you tr treat the fact that going online and you have massive amounts of data that you encounter, and you've got to think about how to deal with that, that changes. And that's because the methodological uh, affiliation of netnography is like uh, like ethnography. It's in meaning making. Uh, it's in culture. It's in sense making. But the reality that is confronted by someone doing netnography is very different from someone doing ethnography, because an ethnographer has to make a lot of effort to find a group to gain access. So think about that person going on a boat. Uh, or, or flying in modern times to Bora Bora or somewhere in the, the South Pacific or somewhere uh, you know, deep in the, in the Amazon in, in uh, Ecuador. Uh, that person has to make a huge effort to get to that place, to stay in that place, to learn a new language, to fit in, to find people who are going to speak with them, uh, to spend time, to, to absorb what's going on. And it's a, yeah, it's a very uh, time intensive, labor intensive, uh, emotional and intellectually all-encompassing experience to do that kind of ethnography. Gathering data is really hard. You have to take those pictures. You have to write in your field note. You have to conduct those interviews and ask those questions in ethnography. But in ethnography, if I want to study a topic like the one that I just mentioned, white supremacy, I can go online and I can find reams of information so much that is being said, so much is being debated. What is white supremacist? What is, what is the line between being a white supremacist and just having, say, strong opinions about, about being white? Uh, where are these boundaries? Uh, uh, where are the discussions happening? Which platforms shut them down? Which platforms still allow them uh, to happen? What are the links to things like uh, like conservative politics and so on? I can find all of these things being discussed online. So much data that I don't know how to handle it. 
So the differences between ethnography and ethnography are pretty big when it comes to data. In one, data is very precious and, and really has to be uh, uh, you know, uh, gathered and, and there's a lot of effort in gathering it. In the other one, you're almost overwhelmed with a waterfall of data as soon as you can think of, uh, of you know, many of these kinds of social science topics. So how we deal with that becomes a huge uh, uh, question that has to be answered uh, in, in ethnography. And so I, you know, I, I try to uh, deal with that. So cultural entree in ethnography, very hard. Cultural entree in ethnography, very, very easy. Ethics in ethnography, well, there are lots of issues with ethics in ethnography, uh, but you are not invisible like a fly on the wall as you are in ethnography. And so ethnography has to have specific guidelines for dealing with the fact that you're largely invisible and you can overhear all of these conversations. And some of them might be very compromising. Uh, there have been interesting studies that have been written about um, teenagers talking about their alcohol use, for example. Well, it's studying a vulnerable population and a sensitive topic. Uh, people talking about their sex lives online. Uh, uh, people who are trans, who are discussing uh, their, their challenges uh, and their rights. Uh, these are also sensitive topics. And some of this data, it, it may be public, but it can also be traced to real people with real identities. Well, how does the researcher deal with that? These are not problems that ethnographers encountered. When someone had a conversation with someone in a village, it generally was not traceable in a search engine to that person. So everything changes in ethnography, and we have to have, in my opinion, we have to have good, solid procedures that guide our research, that we all sort of agree are a good idea, that ground it, that we can teach and, uh, and uh, use to have uh, a body of knowledge that is comparable uh, and that is a set of standards that are rigorous and agreed upon. Netnography has been used in so many fields. Um, its uh, origins are in uh, fan studies and media studies. So I began by studying uh, media fans, in particular Star Trek fans. That extended quickly to a number of fans of other shows. And the first uh, work that I published on ethnography was uh, looking at fans of the X-Files series. And that touched on conspiracy theories uh, and UFOs, they're now called UAPs. Uh, these are themes that have really uh, been really interesting because they stick around, they bounce around. The notion that uh, social media is used to share conspiracy theories about uh, government cover-ups is a really interesting one when you think that I was researching this in 1995, 1996 uh, and publishing it in 1997. You can see that these things are not new. Um, there's been a long history of people using techniques like ethnography and writing about flame wars and trolling and the fact that uh, you know people when they have a little bit of a sense of distance from other people or a little bit of this cloak of anonymity that they antagonize one another. Uh, and so fan studies was one of the areas where I was inspired. Uh, Henry Jenkins, who has become my lifelong mentor, uh, had been writing about uh, fan communities online before I was and inspired me to do uh, some of my work and some of the development in ethnography. Uh, but you know, there are so many areas that we can think of that are affected by the online world. So. Um, I have a colleague, Killian O'Leary, who wrote a chapter in my new book, Netnography Unlimited, which I'll mention a few times, about online gambling. So gambling now, you know, it used to be that we would have to go to a casino to gamble. Now all we need is a cell phone or a tablet or access to our computer. So this whole world, this whole universe of online gambling has its own customs, its own language, its own meaning and symbol systems. There's also a lot of uh, shady stuff that happens online. And another colleague, uh, Alexia Maddox and Mani Barrett, uh, looked at the dark web, which is the dark web is basically um, addresses and locations online that you can't reach from a search engine like Google. You sort of have to be in the know. And oftentimes you have to have a special program, an encryption or decryption program in order to reach particular sites 
where things go on like sales of weapons or sales of drugs or even human trafficking. Um, so these colleagues conducted a study of the dark web and of crypto markets, uh, understanding how these um, uh, uh, people were using these social media affordances uh, to bypass uh, legal restrictions. And in order to do that work, they had to do uh, development of uh, some of the confidentiality procedures uh, in, in that monography. But they also, as a result, came up with very interesting theoretical developments around things like uh, social media use and uh, this borderland of legality and illegality. There are several people who are studying how uh, illicit drug cultures uh, use online uh, platforms to educate one another and support each other. For example, in using uh, illegal drugs and giving guidance on uh, how not to overdose, for example, or what to do if you get into trouble. So you won't see those kinds of, of things normally in more standard uh, online medical uh, platforms. People go to uh, some of these more illicit platforms in order to find out uh, you know, uh, how to get high uh, from things that you can buy over the counter, for example, uh, uh, in a pharmacy. Um, there is work on military communities uh, by Donna Schumann and her co-authors, where she studied um, war veterans who have post-traumatic stress disorder and create uh, YouTube videos uh, to share that and build uh, links between each other and between the public, sharing their experiences and also, um, you know, uh, uh, helping others in, in a therapeutic sense. That sense of uh, using online has also been explored a number of times because people are using uh, online platforms and resources in healthcare. And so there have been uh, studies of sites, for example, like uh, the one patients like me, where people with various uh, kinds of um, uh, conditions uh, group together and discuss their diagnoses, discuss their therapies, their treatment plans, suggest uh, ongoing um, uh, uh, trials of new pharmaceuticals, uh, link up people with, with, with pharmaceutical trials and with uh, doctors and uh, assess each other's uh, health plans. Now, this has changed the world of healthcare. Doctors used to have an individual relationship with a particular patient, uh, tell them what the truth was, the, the truth, uh, and give them a prescription or, or give them some advice uh, and send them away. And that was the end of that relationship. Well, that's sort of where the, that's just a part of the relationship that many people have with their own healthcare. So, for example, if someone's diagnosed with cancer now, pretty much the first thing they do is go online and see what all the options are. Then they go to these different communities and start having discussions with people who have similar conditions, similar diagnoses, family members who have been through this, getting all these stories, getting all this advice. Think about how people use uh, Facebook, for example, in this way. So all of these support communities are out there and these dedicated uh, uh, communities. And so people are second guessing their doctors they are getting other diagnoses. They are even reaching out to people who might have some sort of a medical uh, background online. This has revolutionized the world of uh, healthcare. Uh, and so there's a lot of work being written about this. Um, so uh, my colleagues, Henrik Erickson and uh, Martin Salzman Erickson's work in nursing has looked at a number of these implications. They've also done some very interesting and creative adaptations of netnography, one that I uh, uh, always give to my PhD students is a very visual um, netnography that they did where they studied, I believe it was, uh, I think it was a hundred nursing tattoos that were available to them on Google Images. And they sorted those into categories and said, this is uh, how nurses think about, and the public think about the role of nursing and the, the meanings of nursing by uh, interpreting and finding patterns in the kinds of tattoos 
that were nursing related that were shared on Google Images, which was really, really, really interesting. Netnography has also been really uh, very useful in gaming studies, understanding uh, uh, the, the kinds of gatherings, the kinds of communications, the kinds of relationships, uh, the kinds of uh, uh, technology adaptations that are done by gamers when they're they're playing games, when they're communicating uh, with each other, uh, when when they're when they're actually uh, playing. Um, and you know, I could I could go on and on. There's a lot of work in tourism uh, and travel around how people plan. Uh, one work uh, very recently by my colleague uh, Ulrika Gretzel used netnography to conduct uh, a study of Pinterest boards that people were using during COVID to plan their travel and in fact to dream about travel when they couldn't travel. And so how the visual medium and the affordances of uh, a particular social media platform being Pinterest, which is a very visual site where you pin different images down that are linked to different sites, how that um, revealed the kinds of dreams that people had during COVID uh, when they couldn't travel. And then in education, I think there's a, a, been a lot of interesting adaptations. Uh, and uh, one that I, I really liked, but there are many that I really liked, was by uh, Fujita, Harrigan, and Sutar in 2017, where they looked at how universities create community uh, and how they uh, enhance the physical community uh, by uh, uh, creating this online uh, element to the university experience. And obviously that was 2017. In 2020, we've had a burgeoning of research looking at things like distance learning. And of course, the, uh, the very interesting and important auto netnography work, which is a reflective netnography of Liz Howard, who's in the Isle of Wight, about distance learning and about being an educator, teaching others uh, through, through distance learning has been really, really salient and really, really important. But conferences, work life, um, relationships with family and friends, uh, planning travel, um, the list goes on and on now. We really didn't have much life for the last 14 months outside of our online lives. And so all of it has become amenable and in fact, uh, really demanding of our ethnographic engagement. And that one of the ways that that can happen in a rigorous way uh, is through netnography. The practical implications of netnography uh, are uh, important, and that's the last topic that I'll discuss. So I've been working with with uh, companies and organizations since 2007, that's 14 years now, uh, trying to apply some of these ideas to the problems that organizations uh, have. So one of my first clients was Campbell Soup, and Campbell Soup had a site called Campbell's Kitchen that um, they felt they could be using better they had sort of read some of my work. They had seen me speech some speak some of the people uh, in management there, and they you know obviously were attuned to the idea that community was becoming increasingly important. It was I think 2005 2006. So Facebook and Twitter had just begun. Uh, the term social media hadn't emerged. We used to call it online community or virtual community still back then. But they wanted there to be more of a community feel. Uh, to, to Campbell's Kitchen. And so I did a, a netnography and I compared Campbell's Kitchen to a number of other uh, different sites and particularly blogs were very big uh, at that time. But I was also looking at these other uh, recipe and meal planning sites. And I came up with a list of uh, practical suggestions that they could implement and bring to their uh, development team, which, which they later did. Uh, and they doubled uh, the amount of, of people who were visiting their site. Uh, and uh, created a more sticky site, a site where people were more engaged, were, 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 were doing more things. So that was one early engagement uh, uh, with uh, netnography in, in a corporate sphere. Uh, one, another early client was in the pharmaceutical industry and they were interested in the same sorts of issues that I was talking about uh, earlier in this interview, which was how people were um, uh, enhancing their healthcare uh, routines by uh, reaching out in particular to, to health bloggers. And they were very interested in uh, the people who were blogging about health uh, in particular areas uh, and what they could learn about them and learn about the, the overall system. 
One of the projects that I worked on quite recently, which uh, I'm particularly proud of, was not with a uh, uh, for-profit corporation, but with a, uh, a non-profit called the a Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, which is out of Washington, D.C. And their mission is to try and eliminate uh, uh, underage childhood uh, nicotine use. Uh, and they contacted me around 2016. They had noticed that there were a, a lot of social media content which appeared to be organic, but not quite. There was something uh, a little bit uh, apparently artificial or prompted uh, by this content in a number of countries. I believe they came to me with data from something like 14 uh, d different countries. And they wanted me to put together an ethnography uh, which could uh, get behind the scenes uh, and understand uh, exactly what was, was going on behind all of this uh, social media content showing young people uh, who were smoking. Uh, particularly the focus of this was on combustibles, but uh, we also found a lot of e-cigarette uh, use as well. And so that project uh, required, uh, as I say, a complete uh, research design from starting from the ground up. And that one required a multicultural team. So I uh, and my colleagues uh, recruited uh, 10 other researchers uh, across 11 other countries. So we had, you know, Ukraine, we had uh, Brazil, we had Italy, uh, and South Africa originally was in there. So there were a number of countries where we knew that there were uh, a lot of uh, social media posts being generated that had young people uh, using cigarettes in particular. Um, and so we needed people who were insiders on in the culture, and then we train them up uh, on ethnography so that we were all using similar procedures and and understood what we we're doing. And one, one aspect of what we did was we would message out or direct message people who were doing the posts and try and interview them as well. So one of the things I didn't talk about in ethnography is that it also does include uh, interviews. It's not just a, a, a data download or a researcher writing their own immersion journal notes in a journal that's something, you know, the analog of a ethnographers field notes. We reached out to people and sometimes they responded. And as a result of this research, we found that uh, there were uh, social media uh, training campaigns that were being undertaken by uh, the large tobacco companies around the world. They weren't being done in the UK, they weren't being done in Canada and the US, but they were being done in places like Indonesia uh, and uh, 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 South Africa uh, and Egypt uh, and Italy uh, and Brazil. Uh, and we even managed to get a contract between a public relations firm and an in influencer and also to find out in interviews, um, you know, that uh, the uh, companies that were working for the tobacco companies were, for instance, specifying that they take a certain number of pictures uh, with uh, cigarettes in them and that they try and cover the warning label uh, on the cigarette package or have it uh, facing away from them, uh, that they preferred, uh, you know, social scenes where people were smoking, all of the things that actually uh, were forbidden uh, from some of the uh, tobacco laws. And so as a result of this work, uh, the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids um, uh, had a, uh, a major series of uh, media stories, beginning with one in the New York Times, um, about what was going on to essentially expose this to the public, and at the same time, uh, launched a petition with the Federal Trade Commission uh, in the United States to try and have them uh, look at these uh, breaches uh, of the deceptive advertising uh, rules of, of by these different companies uh, around the world, which includes, of course, Altria slash Philip Morris, uh, one of the largest tobacco companies, which was doing a lot of this stuff along with, you know, the other big uh, tobacco companies uh, in other countries, not in America, but in other countries and using 
social media platforms. And as a result of that work, uh, some of the major platforms uh, like Facebook uh, and Instagram have cracked down and begun enforcing the rules that they were not enforcing before about uh, their uh, social media influencers uh, promoting tobacco uh, products of different kinds. There's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, there's still a lot of regulation that needs to happen. And this is ongoing work. I'm currently uh, working, actually, after I get off this interview, I'm going to be working on a, another paper of mine uh, that's looking at uh, uh, how um, some of these social media efforts and viral marketing efforts have infiltrated youth culture. So there have been a lot of applications. I'm certainly not the only person doing this. I do this through my consulting company. There are a number of companies that use netnography, particularly to help companies uh, design and develop uh, more innovative products and find out what consumers' needs are, understand how consumers are, for example, uh, using products. And so in this new book that I talked about from Routledge, which is called um, uh, Netnography Unlimited, uh, we have several chapters by uh, practitioners who are uh, working with companies to help them to develop more innovative products. And one of the very important uh, uh, stages at the early part of that innovation work is to do a netnography and to understand how people online are talking about and thinking about that product category and those particular brands.